I'm Shannon Russell Pennington. I'm the staff naturalist with the Warren County Park District. That's me in the picture along with our taxidermy coyote. This was from a couple of summers ago before we had um, all the COVID precautions. Tonight we are going to cover coyote natural history, habitat, vocalizations, diet, what to do if you see one, and one of my very favorite topics to talk about, uh, koi wolves. First, we're going to go through the history and lore. So ancient civilizations have had coyotes. So coyote ancestors have been around for more than a million years. There's actually quite a bit of fossil um, evidence that they've been around for a long, long time. They actually were revered as demigods in Aztec and Native American cultures. They were seen as a trickster, but in a fun and good natured kind of way. They were known for passion, intelligence, music, merriment, practical jokes, and believe it or not, the ability to shape shift. And they had lots of parallels with human behavior, so they were often seen as their own worst enemy. And a lot of times the traditional stories and parables um, actually would teach a human lesson. Then we're going to fast forward a little bit to European settlement times. So settlers didn't know what to make of them. So even though people had been living near coyotes for thousands and thousands of years, once the Europeans moved in, they had never seen anything quite like them before, and they didn't know what to make of them. So some people referred to them as prairie wolves. That actually was Lewis and Clark's term. Western jackals, wild dogs, foxes, dingoes, they went by all kinds of different names. They were not actually classified as their own species until 1823. So just over 200 years ago, uh, we started really learning about this species and what their behavior was like. So let's now introduce Mark Twain. In the year 1872, Mark Twain wrote a book called Roughing It. And in this book, he described coyotes. And this um, description shifted the public's perception. So now they went from going from not knowing what to make of them to maybe I've not seen a coyote yet. The only experience I have is having read this book. And now people are going to start thinking of them in a different way. So now they're regarded as miserable, cowardly, defiant, cruel, and contemptible. And I'd like you to close your eyes just for a moment and listen to this passage from Mark Twain and picture in your mind what this animal might look like. The coyote is a long, slim, sick, and sorry looking skeleton with a gray wolf skin stretched over it, a tolerably bushy tail that forever sags down with a despairing expression of forsakenness and misery, a furtive and evil eye, and a long, sharp face with a slightly lifted lip and exposed teeth. So if you had never seen that animal before, and you read this description of it, all of a sudden you would have this picture in your mind of what this animal is like. So now let's fast forward a little bit to the modern era. In 1948, Chuck Jones created Wile E. Coyote based on Mark Twain's description of the animal. So this is probably what most of us have the most experience with when we think about coyotes, watching this as children. In 2013, TV Guide included Wile E. Coyote on its list of the 60 nastiest villains of all time. And then in 2014, the Canadian PBS nature documentary entitled Meet the Koi Wolf introduced the public to the idea that there are these wolf-coyote hybrids moving among our eastern cities. So you can start to see how all of these cultural influences have made us think about coyotes in a different way than our ancestors may have. So here we are for today. These are just a few things that I took screenshots of uh, prior to our presentation tonight. We have a couple of things uh, from Facebook. These were recent posts that people have made. Um, there's one in the upper left. It says that she's pretty sure that a coyote took her cat. Um, there is a YouTube video in the middle about a coyote attack, attacking a dog. There's um, an actual news story in the upper right. This happened in Columbus, Ohio, a um, little bit less than a year ago, where a coyote approached an officer while he was on patrol doing a traffic stop, and the officer interpreted that to be um, dangerous behavior and tased the animal. 
Uh, we have in the bottom left hand corner one of my favorite pictures. This is actually a coyote vest that you can purchase to put on your small dog if you're going out and you live in a coyote um, infested area, as people like to say. We have some news stories about um, coyotes being dead after they've attacked people. And in the bottom right, there's one from just a couple of weeks ago that I found um, when I was on Nextdoor, another one of the social, uh, social media sites, uh, where somebody had spotted a coyote just sitting out in front of Target down on Fields Ertle Road, and they wanted to know what they should do if they see that. So my goal tonight is to help us keep our pets and our families safe. So people might go about this in different ways. Usually when you see those posts on social media, people are freaking out and you see a wide variety of um, responses to that, going from just kill them to leave them alone, they were here first. So we're gonna try and find the middle ground there but everybody has the same goal, which is to keep our pets and families safe. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna reset. I want you to forget everything that you have learned or heard or seen or read or watched on YouTube about coyotes, and we're gonna start over. So we're gonna take a look, a uh, closer look, so we can understand more about the animal, why they behave the way that they do, how big of a threat are they really, and how our behavior can influ influence their behavior. And then hopefully by the end of the program, you'll feel a whole lot more confident, um, less afraid. You'll feel like you have a better understanding of the animal and will um, we'll understand a little bit more about how our behavior affects their behavior. I like to approach things from a scientific point of view. So the things that I'm going to be presenting tonight are based on scientific studies and research. These are radio collars, ear tags, microchips, measurements in the field, blood draws, DNA samples, litter and pup monitoring, the analysis of stomach content, scat and whiskers, footage from trail cameras and coyote uh, collar cameras. You see that little guy right there? Uh, that is a coyote. He actually has something very interesting in his mouth. He has uh, a Canada goose egg in his mouth. They're actually the largest predator, the biggest predator to the Canada goose population. They like to raid their nests. And then community reports. So talking about science, we like to use evidence. And so the top seven or eight things on that list are going to have um, a stronger significance than the community reports at the bottom, just because people who are not trained sometimes misinterpret what they're seeing but we will take into, into account some community reports too. And finally, mapping software. All right, so this is the animal that we're talking about. These are the characteristics. They are much smaller than wolves. They're about the size of a medium dog, so 30 to 45 pounds-ish. Uh, I actually attended a program and they had a pelt of a coyote versus a pelt of a wolf and it was amazing to see the difference. I think because we don't have wolves in Ohio um, and coyotes are our biggest thing, we kind of um, inflate them in our minds a little bit, but they're really not even comparable at all. They have pointy ears, a narrow snout, yellow eyes, and kind of a smile. They always kind of look like they're grinning. A bushy tail that hangs low at a 45 degree angle, even when they're running. So this is one of the ways that you can tell whether you're looking at a dog or a coyote. So when dogs run, their tails go up. When coyotes run, their tails stay down in that 45 degree angle position. They have a loping gait and long, thin legs. Most of the time they have a mottled gray with black tipped tail, a coat that's that color of the upper right hand corner, but they can be any of a variety of different morphs of different colors in there. Those are all coyotes on the screen right there. Um, the one in the upper right here is the most typical. And they're curious, they have a shy nature. They have a balance of predator and prey instincts, which makes them very adaptable creatures. All right, their vocalization. So if you have not seen a coyote before, perhaps you have heard one. It's kind of an eerie noise. It might sound like there are many, but because they have such a range of vocalizations, it might be just one or two. You'll probably hear them more often than see them. And scientists think that the reason that they're calling um, can be for a number of different reasons. It could be the mom calling her pups back in 
to gather them up for the night, just like we do with our kids when the street lights go out in the middle of summer. You call everybody back in. Um, it can be that they are assessing the population density in relation to the resources that are available. So they're saying, hey, I'm here. They're listening to hear if anybody else around is calling back. And they're kind of establishing their territorial boundaries that way. So let's take a listen to the coyote call. Okay, so hopefully if you have not heard one before, now you kind of have a better idea of what one would sound like. So why are they here? And by here I mean in Ohio. So um, I'm based in Southwest Ohio near Northern Cincinnati. And a lot of times when I see people commenting on social media about coyote conflicts, somebody will inevitably chime in, they were here first. Well, kind of. They were here first in the Western United States. They were here for a long, long time in the Western in the United States. However, they didn't move into Ohio until much later. So prior to the mid 1800s, they weren't on the Eastern side of the country at all. So in 1856, we're gonna go through a little bit of a history lesson here. The first bridges were built across the Mississippi River. So 1850s. Then we're gonna fast forward a little bit. 1860s, we're starting to build railroads, transcontinental railroads the 1880s to 1930s. This is when we started to see an increase in ranching and farming. So habitats were changing from prairies and forests with lots of prey animals to fields with sheep and goats and cows and chickens. And people started to adapt this mindset that the only good predator is a dead predator. And so this is when the government started to introduce private and, and federal predator and rodent extermination uh, programs. So just think about how that shift in mindset and the shift in the ecological landscape changed things. So we went from having um, very few people in the area, lots of trees, lots of prairies, lots of prey, to now we have lots of people, railroads, bridges, we've cleared the land and now we're farming and ranching instead. So by 1923, there were almost no wolves left anywhere in America. Because of that, the coyotes were elevated to public enemy number one. Mass extermination programs that I mentioned earlier worked. They worked on just about everything. They worked on wolves and bears and mountain lions and bobcats, but they didn't work on coyotes. And in fact, instead of dying out, coyotes, their population exploded. So here we are in Ohio. This is a map that was provided by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. You can look at the key there and see your county and what the population density is, um, the relative distribution. So in Warren County, this is us right here in the lower left, that dark area, we have a high concentration of coyote population. So the first coyote was not recorded in um, Ohio until 1919, so 100 years ago. So now they're found in all of Ohio's 88 counties. Warren County is a region of relatively high coyote concentration. And notice those other high concentration areas, including the metropolitan areas. So we have Columbus down here. We have uh, Toledo and Cleveland up there. So they're not just in farmlands. They are in um, cities as well. So they can and do live everywhere. So let's take a peek at their habitat. Grasslands and prairies, this is where they originated, right, out west. Deserts, eastern woodlands, boreal or snow forests, agricultural lands, urban parks, including um, Central Park in downtown New York, the suburbs, cities, literally everywhere and their diet. So this is a picture of a typical coyote hunting posture. Small rodents make up 42% of their diet. White-tailed deer, 22%. And when I say white-tailed deer, I don't want you to picture coyotes swarming a deer and taking it down like a wolf might. What we talk about when we mean white-tailed deer is they're getting roadkill. They're picking off something that is 
readily available to them and that they don't have to work very hard for. So there are some studies that show um, day old fawns can become uh, prey for coyotes, but we're primarily talking about roadkill with the white-tailed deer. Fruit, 23% of their, uh, the samples had fruit in them. Eastern cottontail rabbits, 18%. Bird species, 13%, that would include eggs, so nests that were being raided, like the, the um, Canada goose from earlier. Raccoon is 8%. Grass, 6%. Invertebrates, 4%. Um, there is actually a video floating around from Dr. Stan Garrett's research where he had attached a radio collar um, to a coyote, and they show one walking through the woods on a rainy night, slurping up earthworms as if they were spaghetti. So that would be part of the invertebrates that they're finding. Human associated is 2%, so that would be garbage. Muskrat, 1%. Domestic cat, 1%. So most of the attacks on pets are related to territorial disputes. They're not looking for food. So again, with those comments that we see on social media, um, you know, the feral cats and things like that, that's not what the coyotes are after. That's not what they prefer. It's not what they like. It's not easy, so they don't go for it. They're going to take advantage of whatever is available to them at that time. The small rodents are what they like. It's what they make up the most of their diet. And everything else is kind of pieced together from what's available at the time. So during the summer, when we have fruit available, um, things, apples falling off of your apple tree, they're going to go for that because it's available and it's easy versus this time of year in the middle of winter that kind of stuff is not available so they're going to be looking for other things and so here is a picture two pictures actually of coyote scat this is coyote poo it's the scientific way of saying poop so take a look this looks different than dog poo does it's full of fur you can sometimes find bones and things in it you might find seeds it's long, it's tapered at the end, it's kind of has this sort of ropey, twisty look to it, and it's often laid right in the middle of a sidewalk or a trail. This is another display of territorial um, presence. So they're saying, hey, this is my trail, don't mess with me, other coyotes, this is mine, stay out of my way. So those are both, um, take, those pictures were taken from Kingswood Park here in Deerfield Township um, about two years ago. And you can go out, if you, once you know what you're looking for, you're going to find it everywhere. So breeding habits and patterns aren't those cute little pups. They mate for life. Breeding season is late January through March. The peak is actually Valentine's Day. That makes it very easy to remember. They have a gestation period of about two months. So the pups are born in April through June. Coyotes only den when they have pups. So it's about a six week period. They start venturing out with their parents around three weeks of age, and then they will become more transitory. So I'm gonna put a call to action here for everybody who is watching tonight. Next time we get an unseasonably warm day, I want you to go outside and take a peek around your yard and look and see if you have any potential denning spots. This is the time of year when you should be boarding those up because in a couple of months when it's really cold outside and coyotes are looking for places to den, if you have a hole underneath your deck or an access point that goes underneath your shed, they're going to take advantage of that and you definitely do not want them denning in your yard. Litter sizes are between two and 19. The average is usually around five to six. And the pups will be hunting on their own by fall. So around nine months of age, they appear to be full grown. They're kind of lankier looking than their moms and dads, but they're full grown at that size. Their lifespan, it's about four years in rural areas, three times longer when living among people. So the coyotes that we have living in our suburbs are going to live longer than they do out in the country. It's because of resource availability. So extermination efforts. So again, with the social media thing, somebody inevitably will say, you just need to kill them. If you have one in your neighborhood, just get rid of it. Well, here's how that works. We have been trying to get rid of coyotes for hundreds of years now by shooting, trapping, poisoning, denning, the introduction of sarcoptic mange, aerial gunning, plastic sheep collars that are laced with compound 1080, which is a poison, chemical sterilization. So we have tried all of these different approaches and they don't work. 
So here is a historic photograph. Fast forward to today. This is still going on, yet we still have coyotes. The reason that this happens is because coyotes have an innate ability to assess the area's population. Their internal organs will trigger larger um, litter sizes. If they take into account, there's a lot of stuff around here for me to eat, there's a lot of territory for me to explore, I can have a bigger litter size. It's not something that they consciously do, it just happens. But this is something that studies have proven again and again and again, is that you take one out, you're gonna have another one move right back into its space. We're gonna go into the hunting and trapping and then I'll tell you an alternative. It is open season on coyotes all year long in Ohio. There's no daily limit. There are gonna be, of course, local laws restricting hunting and trapping in neighborhoods. Uh, rifle and night vision scopes are legal for coyote hunting. So there are some stipulations on there. Uh, regarding deer season, but those are legal. So what we recommend instead of just trying to exterminate all of them is selective removal of problem animals. So sometimes you're going to run into coyotes that are just being coyotes. And we talked about how many rodents and small mammals they eat. They actually do serve an important purpose in our ecosystem. So they help keep out the rodent population. They keep that from exploding. So it's you know, it's not a bad thing to have them here necessarily. We just have to make sure that we're keeping the bad actors out. So we'll selectively remove the problem animals. So this is what we've been doing currently. 300,000, these are reported numbers, to 800,000, that's the estimated total, um, of coyotes are killed annually. That's 2,500 per year in Ohio. So keep in mind that the mass removal has been scientifically proven to increase their litter size and expand the range. So that approach does not work. So human and pet encounters. Here's what we want to do instead. So coyotes in your backyard, what do you want to do? Well, first of all, let's get some perspective here. There have been two human deaths in all of recorded history by coyotes. One of them was in California in 1981. It was a young girl who was left outside. Her parents had been feeding the coyote in her yard. They left her outside to play. I think she was two or three years old and an unfortunate um, incident occurred. Totally preventable. The next one was 2009. That was in Nova Scotia. So we're up in you know Northern Canada, so not near us. Um, and that was a runner who was running in an area that was well known to have lots of coyotes. She had her earbuds in, so she couldn't hear them approaching, and she was attacked and killed, uh, unfortunately. But again, perspective. So two people in all of recorded history. Compare that to dog bites, which result in an average of four deaths per year. So in nearly every incident of human and pet encounters, there's human error involved. So I would encourage you to go to YouTube, poke around on the videos and look at them from, um, from a perspective of somebody who's looking for a human to do something wrong. I bet you can find it. It's almost always somebody bending down trying to offer the coyote something in their hand or you know they're, they're outside mowing the lawn and they see a coyote and instead of scaring the coyote off, they stand there and video it instead. So. The majority of these instances are completely preventable. You have control. So studies have repeatedly shown that those encounters increase due to purposeful or inadvertent feeding. And the respectful coexistence is key. So the strategy here is that we're gonna to learn to reinforce that we are the top dog. And easy behavior uh, changes on our part make a huge difference. So the main thing here is to identify the normal, curious, appropriate behavior versus a problem coyote, where escalating aggression is something that needs to be addressed immediately. Because I think what happens a lot of times is people see coyote and they automatically in their mind picture this is a wolf, big bad wolf, it's going to attack me. And that's just it's something that is evolutionarily built into our systems and it's once you start thinking about it logically, you can overcome that. So we need to be able to tell whether it's normal behavior versus a threat. So let me show you some pictures here. These are normal, acceptable, quote unquote, good coyote behavior. So there's a picture of a coyote. He's standing back off towards the edge of the, the woods. 
is kind of faced away from us. That's a compost pile of leaves in the background. That actually was taken by a kindergarten teacher um, at the school where I teach nature programs sometimes, at J.F. Burns Elementary School. She took that out of her classroom window. That is an okay coyote behavior. It's not approaching anybody. It is not barking viciously. It probably is hunting some, uh, I've seen garter snakes, I've seen mice back there. So it probably was hunting something in that leaf pile. So a coyote moving through a common area at any time of day, that's totally okay. That's appropriate behavior. A coyote resting in a common area any time of day, that's okay. Seeing scat in a park, perfectly okay. If you hear howling at night, that's okay. That's normal behavior. A coyote running off when it sees a person, stopping about 50 feet away, sitting down and just looking at you. Believe it or not, that's okay. It has um, shown that it understands it can't be right next to you. It's moved away and now it's going to sit back and kind of observe what's going on. So the human response in this situation is do nothing. You don't need to do anything here. Just make sure that you're limiting your food sources. Um, if you have pets that you've been feeding outside, make sure that you bring that food in at night. Supervise your pets, obviously. Don't let them run free. If you know that you live in an area where coyotes have been sighted, be smart. So here's coyote behavior that should be hazed. This is, um, we'll get into hazing a little bit later, but just keep that in the back of your mind for now. If you see a coyote in your yard, this is a territorial problem. We need to make sure that they understand your yard belongs to you, your family, and your pets, not them. If you see a coyote on or near a path when you're walking, this is something that needs to be hazed. If you see a coyote sniffing around areas where your kids and pets frequently play, that's something that needs to be hazed. So the human response here is to haze the animal until it completely leaves the area. You wanna limit your food sources again, supervise your pets, don't let them run free, and make sure that you share your observations with your neighbors so that they can be aware too. I don't mind it when people say, hey, I saw a coyote in my, in my neighborhood. That's appropriate. You should be telling your neighbors if you see a coyote. The twist here is we don't need to freak out about it unless something is off. And at the moment, just seeing one is not something to worry about. These are all fixable coyote behaviors. These are canids. They're related to dogs. They're trainable. They're very intelligent. And by changing our behavior, we can reinforce what is appropriate and what is allowed and what is not. So here are some iffy things. This, we're starting to get into the orange level here. Free range neighborhood cat goes missing. People are always gonna assume that it was a coyote that took it. There's not a whole lot of proof that that is true, but if one goes missing, that's an iffy behavior. If a coyote does not immediately respond to hazing, but eventually it runs off, that's iffy. The response here is to continue to haze the animal until it completely leaves the area. Limit your food sources, don't let your pets run free, um, all of those same things. And this is where you wanna be really talking to your neighbors. If you see something in this iffy behavior um, category, really wanna be spreading, spreading around what you've been seeing. Use the science-backed evidence. You know, this is something that can be fixed. This is where local government might need to start making sure that they're enforcing the leash laws, for example. Um, might need to start doing a communication effort to make sure people are not leaving food out, things like that. You can also contact your wildlife officer for advice. So 1-800-WILDLIFE is the phone number that we have in Ohio, and you can get in touch with wildlife officers there. So here is the red level behavior, not acceptable. You should report this immediately. These are problem animals that need to be taken care of. If a coyote approaches a person aggressively, think about aggression. This means that their hackles are raised, they're growling, baring their teeth, barking viciously. Something there is off. This is not normal coyote behavior. It probably is either ill, injured, or possibly protecting its young. But these are things that we don't wanna be messing with. If a coyote is stalking a pet or human, that obviously is not okay. Again though, Think about this logically. What does stalking really mean? And what does that look like versus an animal that's being curious and just kind of taking in his surroundings? Clearly, if a coyote attacks a pet or a human, that coyote needs to go ASAP. 
So this is an instance where you should contact your wildlife officer immediately. 1-800-WILDLIFE. Um, you can get in touch with me and I can get you in touch with our local wildlife officer. These are things that need to be addressed immediately before there is a problem um, and before things um, escalate even further. So um, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the Ohio Division of Wildlife before reaching out to local law enforcement. Local law enforcement is trained to deal with things that deal with humans primarily. They are not wildlife professionals. So a lot of times they have the same um, mindset that people who don't have training in these things do. Remember that video clip that was featured earlier in the slideshow about the Columbus police officer uh, who was on a traffic stop and a coyote came at him? He called it a wolf in the video. That's not to say that he's a horrible police officer or anything like that, but it does demonstrate that that officer was not properly trained in identifying and dealing with coyotes. So just call 1-800-WILDLIFE if you do have a problem. So what is hazing? This is the fun part, and this is why I'm missing my in-person programs right now, because um, it's always funny to see this in person. You're gonna have to use your imagination here. These are humane ways to enforce that we are the top dog. This works for all Ohio wildlife. Um, it's not something you would wanna do with like a grizzly bear, for example, if you were out west, but anything that we have in Ohio, this works and this is appropriate. So it's just using visual and auditory cues um, to tell an animal to get away. So essentially you make yourself big, loud, and scary. Do anything that you can think of to, to help make yourself as huge as possible, as loud as possible. You can flick on lights, you can um, use a flashlight, you can clap your hands, stomp your feet, you can use your voice, get away coyote. Um, you can shake things, you can use radios, whistles, horns, pots and pans, shakers, anything like that. Of course, if you're out on a walk and you don't have anything with you, you still have, you can clap your hands, you can open your coat so that it makes you appear bigger. Think about how animals act when they um, feel scared or threatened. That's what we're trying to channel here, right? You can use hoses, squirt bottles, etc. if you're at home. You can throw things toward, not at, you don't want to actually hit it, throw something toward the coyote. It looks like she's got a black walnut that she's throwing in her picture here. Um, anything that is going to tell the animal, just get away. Like, this is mine, this is not yours, you need to scoot. I'd like you to think about how you would react if you saw your own dog jump onto your kitchen table and start eating the dinner that you just prepared for your family. That is the same reaction you should have if you're humanely hazing an animal. There is a caveat here. You do not ever haze animals that are injured or sick, that are cornered, or that are guarding a den of pups. So you have to kind of keep that in mind, get your perspective again. You don't want to mess with animals that are injured or sick. In that kind of uh, case, what you'd want to do instead, you can still make yourself big, loud, and scary, but rather than waiting for it to get out of the way, you would retreat and then call 1-800-WILDLIFE instead. So the main thing though is to avoid conflict in the first place. So don't feed the coyotes either intentionally or unintentionally. This means pet food. If you have a cat that you're feeding outside, bring the pet food in. Grill drippings, trash, fallen fruit from trees, bird feeders. So they're not going to go for um, the bird seed itself. They're going to go for the mice and birds and things that like to congregate under the bird feeders. If you have compost piles uh, that have exposed food scraps in them, you wanna get rid of that. Don't let your pets run loose, obviously. Never run from a coyote. This triggers their predator instinct. So if you run from one, it's gonna chase you, just like dogs chase after cars. So this is something that's really important to communicate with your children. Maybe you're watching with your child right now. When we log off tonight, I want you to practice hazing with each other. See who can come up with the biggest, scariest um, method of getting rid of coyotes. Pretend you have one walking into your neighborhood. How would you react? So you can use repellents as we met, uh, mentioned before. So motion activated lights and sounds, they are smart. So they do kind of get used to things. Once they figure out, oh yeah, you're just gonna shake a jar of pennies at me, it's not gonna do anything. 
they might start to get a little bolder again. So switch it up every once in a while. Um, something that I've heard is very effective is to take an umbrella and kind of pop it open and closed um, to scare something off. So the main thing here is to not create conflict where conflict does not already exist. So we've already learned about how to identify the difference between a normal, typical coyote behavior versus one that is a problem that needs to be eliminated right away. Keep that in mind. You don't want to escalate a situation um, that isn't already there. And obviously report those aggressive or fearless coyotes. I think what you'll find, however, is that once you look at things um, a little bit differently, and rather than having that knee-jerk instinct, you think first, you're going to notice that probably what you're picturing in your mind as a big, mean, ferocious coyote is not such a big deal after all. All right, so here we go into the coy wolves. This is one of my favorite subjects to talk about, and let's go see if we can dispel some of these myths. So I saw a huge coyote. It must have been at least 60 pounds. It was probably a koi wolf. Right. So here are some facts. The largest coyote ever recorded was 75 pounds. That was in Wyoming in 1937. So of course this was prior to um, DNA testing. So we can't even we can't even say that that definitely was a coyote. So for comparison, where uh, we have these coyote hunting contests. The largest one, 53 pounds. There is our taxidermy coyote again in the background. That's my 53 pound dog in the foreground there, just for comparison's sake. She's considerably larger than our taxidermy sample. And this is why people misestimate um, or overestimate. So think about what it looks like when you give your dog a bath and they're nice and big and fluffy. And then when they look like after they're wetted down, right? All of a sudden you can tell, oh, that was mostly fur. That's what we're seeing this time of year in particular. People are seeing huge, quote unquote, huge coyotes. It's because of their fur. It's because they have um, their winter coats right now. So meet the koi wolf. This is a program that was a nature documentary from 2014. The description that they give is the koi wolf, a mixture of western coyote and eastern wolf, is hauntingly beautiful carnivore found increasingly on the streets of North American cities. So this is where the concept of a koi wolf living among us came from. When you picture that, it's like a 50-50 mix, right? Like half coyote, half wolf. Well, that's not what this is. Even in the most extreme cases, it's not what we're talking about. The guy in the picture in the background there, that's Dr. Stan Garrett. He was interviewed um, during the filming of that. And this is him again, where he was speaking at the Ohio Wildlife Conference a couple of years ago. So here's the truth about that. The research shows that Ohio coyotes um, that were tested were between 81.8 and 90% coyote, 0.9 to 1.6% wolf, and 8.7 to 16.7 percent dog. So this is from a scientific study that was done back in 2011. They did it in various different areas. In the extreme northeast of the United States, the amount of wolf genome is a bit higher. Um, so that is Dr. Garrett speaking with his slide there. And at the conference, this is a direct quote, I wrote it down, I recorded it, he stated, if I had known that the film was going to be titled Meet the Koi Wolf, I never would have agreed to be in it. They are just coyotes. So I'd love for you to watch the documentary. It's an interesting insight into cutting and splicing and piecing things together to make a story appear to be what you want it to be. So here's that map from earlier. That arrow in the upper right hand corner, when they're talking about koi wolves, that's the spot that they're talking about where they have actually found things that have that higher wolf genome. We are not talking about what we have here in Ohio. There was some interbreeding that happened. This was over 100 years ago. Their estrus periods do not overlap, so it's very difficult for um, wolves and coyotes and domestic dogs to mate successfully. So it's just something that's left over in the, G in the DNA uh, from when they started moving eastward over 100 years ago. So go ahead and watch the documentary. It's well worth it, but pay attention to who is using the term koi wolf. Final thoughts, coyotes are here to stay. Education and respectful coexistence is key. You 
our wonderful liaisons. So your job, now that you've tuned in, clearly you have some sort of interest in natural history and, um, and these animals, you are a perfect liaison. Talk to your neighbors about what you learned tonight. Teach your children the correct way to humanely haze animals. Practice with your kids at home. Practice with yourself. Keep your pets and your food inside. Use the haz hazing techniques when appropriate and report any incidents of true aggression. That's all folks. Thank you for Wiley Coyote for being our, our mascot here. I'm gonna go ahead and put this final slide up for you. That has my email address on it, mother nature's classroom at gmail.com, along with our Facebook page and our Friends of Warren County Park District um, website. So you can go to any of those three for information. Thank you everyone for joining me. Have a wonderful evening.